It's really uh, my pleasure and an honour to be invited here to be with you again tonight uh, to introduce Sister Amina Silmi to speak with you. Tonight um, we're going to have a recitation from the Quran to start the evening from Sister Bushra Rasul. She's uh, six years old and she's the daughter of Sheikh Sibatula Rasul. I knew I'd have trouble pronouncing that, but... <laughs> So if Sister Bushra would like to come and recite the Quran, inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Lam yakun alladhina kafaru min ahli al-kitab wal-mushriki unfakkeen hatta ta'tiyahum al-bayna. رسول من الله يتلو صوفا مطهرا فيها كتب قيمة وما تفرق الذين أوتوا الكتاب إلا من بعد ما جاءتهم البينة وما أمروا إلا ليعودوا الله مخلصين له الدين حنفاء حنفاء ويقيموا الصلاة ويؤتوا الزكاة وذلك دين القيمة إن الذين آمن إن الذين كفروا من أهل الكتاب والمشركين في نار جهنم خالدين فيها أولئك هم شر البرية إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات أولئك هم خير البرية جزاؤهم عند ربهم جنة نات عدن تجري من تحت الأنهار خالدين فيها أبدا رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عن ذلك لمن خش ربه سرق الله العظيم You're all here because you've either heard Sister Amina Asilmi speak already or seen her videos or heard about her She's so very well known, I, ha I hardly feel that I need to introduce her to you. But I'm going to anyway, in case there's some who don't already know her wonderful story. Sister Amina Asilmi first embraced Islam on the 21st of May 1977. She has degrees in education, recreation and broadcasting. She's the director of the International Union of Muslim Women and is on the advisory boards of several Islamic organizations, including um, the American Muslim Council, CARE, the Council of American Islamic Relations, and Amica International, which puts out a children's magazine called Kaleidoscope. Sister Amina thinks her most important roles have been her roles as grandmother and mother or should I say mother and grandmother, in that order. Uh, she has worked in many, many jobs because since her decision to wear the hijab, she's been denied employment in the job of her profession prior to her converting, which was in broadcasting. So they don't allow her to work in broadcasting, so she does many, many other things to help make ends meet. And she told me before we before we came up here tonight that she turned down 47 invitations to speak just during the month of November. So we understand that we're very lucky to have her with us tonight and very honoured that she's been able to accept our invitation. The last time I saw Sister Amina Asilmi she was walking through a bazaar and every three steps she was 14 and 15 year old Muslim women running up and giving her big hugs and, and you can just see the adoration that they have for her and the love that she has for them. And truly she has inspired not only the young American Muslim girls who are growing up in the non-Muslim environment but many, many women who've uh, come to Islam through seeing her videos. So we know that she's a very inspiring woman and we ask Allah to bless her and her family. And I'd like to welcome her here on your behalf tonight. So I like him.
No, 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 that's not enough. There is a lot of Muslims sitting in this room now, please. Okay, let's try it again. Just wake up, get some energy. Salaamu Alaikum. Alaykum. Salam. Well, a few of you, I will say Jazakallah Khair, because they returned better than what I gave, and this is the Sunnah and the way we're supposed to do it. Now, first I have to warn you, she introduced someone else. That's not me, okay? And, and what she saw at the ISNA convention is she hasn't been there very often. See, that's the massive hug fest, and all of the Muslim women are hugging each other every few steps. It's not just me. I mean, we go to the conventions to hug each other. I don't know what the brothers do, but the women go there to get their hugs. So <laughs> that's not just me. That's everybody is being hugged, <laughs> you know. I was asked to come here tonight and talk to you about what you can't hear me Blah. okay let's try bringing it a little bit closer the true liberator of women and I'll be glad to do that but I have to make a small qualification in that Islam is not just the true liberator of women Islam is the true liberator of humanity and we can't talk about how Islam liberated women without how, talking about how Islam has liberated men, has liberated parents, children, grandparents, and all members of society. Because the rights of one is dependent upon the right of the other. And Islam is showing the balanced path. But we will begin with those issues relating to women's rights, and you will soon discover that there's no way to separate or divide the women's rights from men's rights, women's rights from family rights, women's rights from society's rights. And you'll see how totally interdependent we are. Over 1400 years ago, Allah delivered the Quran to Muhammad son of, of Amina. This Quran was protected for all times, will never be corrupted in any way. This was the miracle of this Quran. And this Quran is here today for all of us to be able to read and to learn and to study and to grow and to improve. In this book that was given to us over 1400 years ago, through the prophet who became our example, our clarifier, our explainer, we learned many things. Number one, that the man and the woman were equally responsible for the continuation of the human race. And that the role of the woman was every bit as important as the role of the man. And you cannot claim that one is more important than the other because indeed without the two it cannot occur except in those miracles where Allah has chosen as in the case of Adam, Eve and Isa. Allah did free the woman of responsibility for the original sin. There was a rumor floating around you know that all sin came from women because after all it was Eve who gave that apple to Adam and it was through Eve that all sin came into existence. Well, the Quran came and revealed to us that both sinned, both t were tempted, both sinned, both repented, and both were forgiven. One was not held more responsible for that act than the other. But in another area of the Quran, it speaks about the fact that on the day of judgment, a man must answer for himself, his wife, and his children, while the wife answers only for herself and her children. So a man has a degree of responsibility stronger than that of the woman. We won't make any judgments on that, just something to think about. Over 1,400 years ago, it was ordered that women be educated. It was ordered that all members of society be educated. 
and a prisoner of war could gain their freedom by teaching a Muslim to read and write. That's all that was necessary. This is how important education was considered. Indeed, the example of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, shows the importance of education in that amongst all of the women that he married, there was only one who was not highly educated. All of the mothers of the believers were very educated women. They could read, they could write, they studied, they learned, they were brilliant minds. And his choice was the educated woman. Education is vitally important to everyone, and so we are told to seek knowledge if we must go into China or into the ends of the earth, to seek knowledge. Do not forget in the quest for seeking knowledge that the most important knowledge that you can have is the knowledge of the Quran, because all other knowledge is wasted if you don't know what to do with it. And it is the Quran and the Quran alone that gives us the guidance on what to do with other forms of knowledge. So never neglect the knowledge of the Quran and seeking knowledge of the Quran. That's first and foremost above, above everything else. Well, along with the command that women should be educated, Allah ordered that the woman's voice would be heard. That's right. Our opinions must be heard. Our evidence must be taken. We have a right to be heard. We were given also the right to own our own property, to conduct our own affairs, to dispose of or earn our own wealth and income. And that which we have, that which we earn, that which we inherit, whatever is ours and ours alone, and no one else is allowed to touch it. We have absolute and complete control over that which is ours. We do not have to use our income to provide for ourselves in any way, because our fathers are to provide for us, or our brothers, or our husbands, or our uncles, or our male cousins. The financial responsibility lays upon the man, and yet the woman has absolute and complete control over her own wealth. And yet the woman has complete and absolute control over whatever business ventures that she may have. And even the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, worked for a woman. He took his orders from a woman. He took his pay from a woman. And he never did anything that was against Islam. We go on in talking about true liberation and tell you that the woman also was given the right to choose her own husband. A woman cannot be married without her consent under any circumstances. There's a lot of advice given on how to choose the proper spouse for your daughter or for your son. I only wish Muslims of today followed any of them. I only wish the Muslims of today our mothers and our fathers gave the girls their right, the right that they were ordered to give to their daughters and letting their daughters choose their own husbands. When looking for a husband for our daughters, we are supposed to look first at the religious nature of the individual. First and foremost, religious nature. And then you look towards things that increase compatibility. So you're going to look at educational level, you're going to look at social status, you're going to look at a lot of other things, but first and foremost is the religious standing of the individual and their understanding of Quran and Sunnah. And if you choose a son-in-law, no matter how much money he has, if he is not living by the Sunnah, your daughter will never be treated the way that she has a right to be treated. 
and your grandchildren will never have the joy that they have a right to. And it will be your responsibility because you have chosen your son-in-law for the wrong reasons. As well as a woman was given the right to choose her own husband, the woman was also given the right to divorce. That's right. A lot of people think that divorce is only a right of men. This is not true. You will read in the Sunnah that a woman came before the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, requesting a divorce from her husband. And the Prophet questioned her and, and she admitted that this was a very good man. He was a very kind man. He would provide for her very well. She just didn't like the way he looked. That's all. She didn't like the way he looked and he granted her a divorce. Just on those grounds and those grounds alone. There's a lot of people who talk about, well, you know, divorce laws are not fair in Islam because all a man has to do is say, I divorce you three times and his divorce is finished, but a woman has to go before a qadi in order to get her divorce. <clears throat> Let's not confuse culture and cultural practices with what is in the Quran. Think about this a little bit as you're studying Quran and Sunnah. Okay, yes, a man pronounces three times divorce. He must wait until his wife has, is clean from her menses. And then he makes number one, pronouncement number one. Okay, so this is not done in a state of anger. He has to wait until she's clean from a second menses to make the second pronunciation. And he must wait until the third menses to make the third pronunciation. He must spend that entire three months his divorce is not granted like this, and he can't stand there and say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. This is not a proper divorce, and it's not an acceptable divorce, and it is punishable. Now the woman, when the woman decides to seek divorce, she goes before the Qadi, the divorce is granted, finished. I'm not saying this is the way it's practiced in countries, I'm saying this is the way it's written in the Sunnah. It's finished. Now a man, when he takes his divorce, there's a possibility that he can go back with his wife. When a woman takes a divorce, it's irrevocable. Brothers, don't ever make your wives unhappy enough to divorce you, because you cannot have them again. Don't drive your wives to divorce. You may get upset, but don't drive your wife enough to make her get upset to divorce you. It's finished. But I ask you which one is really easy, not which one is practiced in different countries, but by the Sunnah, which one? I don't think the man has the privilege in this. Now one of the wonderful things also is that the Quran has provided the woman with protection throughout her married life. He must treat her with compassion, kindness, and love. These are the words that are used in the Quran. Kindness, compassion, and love. He must work with her in mutual consultation because on the day of judgment, the man is called to account for every unhappiness that he causes to his wife. Every bit of unhappiness the man is held responsible for. But ladies, don't think you get off. Okay? Because on the day of judgment, you're going to have to answer for the unhappiness you bring your husbands to. Okay? The Quran says we are beautiful garments, one for the other. And when you look at this wonderful, wonderful description of a marriage relationship, beautiful garments, one for the other, and then you think about what kind of garment you would wear above all other garments. And then you strive to be this kind of a garment for your wife or for your husband. You don't want to be a stiff and hard garment that they're eager to throw off. 
You don't want to be a heavy, overly decorated garment that's not comfortable to wear all the time. You want to be a garment that makes you feel warm, safe, secure, and loved. And this is the kind of garment you struggle to be for each other. The garment that demonstrates the ultimate compassion, the ultimate kindness, and the ultimate love. The garment that grows better with years and never wears out, and never grows old, and never becomes worn. This is the description of the husband and the wife. And the relationship between the husband and wife is second only to the relationship between the prophet and Allah. That's how important the relationship is. And Allah has protected the marriage by calling us into arbitration whenever we have problems. We don't just rush off to get a divorce. We must go through arbitration. And the arbitration is accomplished not only with the man and the woman, but there's the man, the woman, her representative, and his representative. And all of these sit together to re try to resolve the problem. 90% of problems between husbands and wives are failure to communicate. Allah knew this. This is why we have the arbitration. Many of the arbitrations that I have set in on, the husband and the wife are fighting, they're not listening to each other, and they're sure that he wants this and she wants that, and you sit down and listen to them and they both want the same thing. But they're not listening to each other and they're not communicating. So when we go through arbitration, we can save the marriage and make the marriage better and make the marriage stronger. Of all those things which are permitted, that which is hated most is divorce. But divorce may occur where it is necessary. Because Allah knows that it is better for two people to separate than to live in discord and unhappiness. Because their unhappiness will come down upon the children, come down upon the society, and generate more problems. So it is better to separate than to live in discord. Now in the case of divorce, again, the women were protected, the children were protected, and the man was protected. A divorce in Islam must be amicable. None of this he, shed, he said, she said stuff. Okay? You are not allowed to talk bad about your ex-husband or your ex-wife. Whatever went on between the two of you is between the two of you and is not to be spread to the rest of the world. Period. You can't say something good, you don't say anything at all. Such wisdom in this. Because when a man and a woman separate, usually what is occurring is they are promptly telling every bad thing they ever imagined about each other. And who is the one that suffers? The child. The child who loves both the mother and the father. The child who needs both the mother and the father. The child who has a right to both the mother and the father. And these two so-called adults are ripping each other apart so much that they forget the needs of the child and the child is the one that pays the price. Now remember that another injunction tells us that we're not supposed to be listening to the backbiting. So if you hear somebody complaining about how bad their ex-husband or their ex-wife was, you're not allowed to listen to it. You have to get up and walk away because on the day of judgment you will have to answer for that. And this is a protection also for the community because the community then is not swept into the uglinesses of divorces and people are not required to take sides and do the other things that, that will cause it to grow and grow and get worse and worse and worse. You see how things are all protected? Allah does not protect one. He protects everyone. You can see where he protects the woman. In this he protects the child, in this he also protects the community. Now there's another wonderful thing 
that the Western world needs to look at when it comes to Islamic divorce. And that is in the realm of responsibility. See, in the United States, when there's a divorce, there is a um, child support payment order. And the child support payment will be anywhere from $50 a month to $350 a month. I mean, even $350 a month doesn't pay a child's expenses, and yet some fathers are only asked to pay $50 a month for their child's expense. After divorce, a woman's income usually drops by 70% and a man's income increases by 70% because the major support of the child is left to the woman. And the child is made to suffer even more because the woman must now leave the child in order to go out and work, in order to feed and clothe the child. And so the child is now left in daycare or with whoever the mother can find and too often left alone. And the children turn to gangs, drugs, alcohol, to whatever they can find in each other or anyone else to make up for that which they are missing. But in Islam, the man's responsibility is 100%. No $50, no $200, no $500, no $600. The responsibility is 100% for this child. 100%. The man must provide everything that the child needs. And that includes his companionship and his guidance. Money is not enough. You see how Islam has liberated? We have peaceful separation with no one suffering. By the man taking 100% responsibility for his child, it makes it possible for the woman to stay at home and continue to be the mother that this child has a right to have. It makes it possible for this child not to suffer neglect. So a man and a woman cannot pull together amicably. The child will not be the victim, not by Islamic law. Oh, there are so many ways that the Quran has liberated us. So very many ways. And we can sit and talk about them forever. And I don't know if I could ever itemize all of them. But I don't want to keep you waiting forever for me to finish. So I'll cover just a couple more. All right? These are some that people frequently hold up as red flags. Okay, we'll start with inheritance. <clears throat> Evidence that Allah holds a woman only half as valuable as a man. Inheritance. I hear this so often and unfortunately from Muslims as well as from non-Muslims. Yes, indeed, the female will inherit one half of what the male will inherit. But who has all the financial responsibilities in the family? The man, right? Now, I have two sons and a daughter. My daughter is not concerned about the fact that her brothers will inherit twice as much as her because she knows that out of their share they have to provide for her and for her children. Out of her share she can do whatever she wants to take a vacation, buy jewelry, a car, a house. She doesn't have to use it for anyone else, not for her children. Not for herself, not for her brothers, but her brothers have to provide for her whatever she needs and for her children whatever they need. I mean, this is if something happens to her husband. They must spend of their inheritance to provide for their wives, for the rest of their family who may be needy, and for needy relatives and neighbors. And yet the woman has no obligation. Another point is that inheritance is not earned income. When it comes to earned income, again, Allah, in his infinite wisdom, has liberated all of humanity by declaring equal wages. For earned income, it is equal. But inheritance is not earned income. This is a charity. This is a gift. It is more appropriate 
that charity would go to the one who had the greatest need. Therefore, more to the male children than to the female children, because the responsibility on the female is much less than what it is on the male. Islam is the only system, whether religious or political, that protects a woman's right to inherit. In most systems, nothing is done about inheritance, and inheritance is destroying families left and right as they fight over who gets this and who gets what and who got more and who got less. The Quran, in mapping out the inheritance, covers not only what the children inherit, but what every other relative would inherit. It is all in there. It is indisputable. So families cannot be destroyed if they follow what is written in the Quran. Now remember, we're not talking about what happens in your cultures. We're talking about what is in the Quran, nothing else. There's no way for families to be torn apart over inheritance when they follow what's in the Quran. One more right, one that is very special to me, and that's the right to hijab. Okay? Hijab is a woman's right. And I don't like it when a person comes up to a Muslim woman and says, why do you wear hijab or why do you cover like that? And they say, because God commanded it. That is not enough of an answer. You need to let people know this is one of our rights. The Quran says to identify ourselves as being Muslim. What greater thing than to be identified as being a Muslim? When I am identified as being a Muslim, this means that I know my worth. I know my value. I will be treated with dignity. I will be treated with respect. I will be treated with that which Allah has granted me. My hijab tells the world that I know my value. My hijab also opens the door to da'wah. Identify yourself as being a Muslim. When I walk down the street, everyone knows I'm someone different, something different, and they may approach me in a variety of different ways. But we have a conversation starter right there, and then we can pick up and go further. Now, one of the common ones occurs when I go into a store and somebody will say, what are you? You know? Now we know. What they want to know is why are you dressed so weird? Okay, that's what they really want to know. But in studying the Sunnah, you see how the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, used humor in dealing with people. He used humor a great deal, so you go ahead and respond with humor. One 7-Eleven store where I was stopped and the woman said that to me, loud voice, my ears are covered, maybe I'm deaf. Loud voice. And what are you? I'm a woman. <laughs> you know, I mean, I know what she wants. I'm a woman. She says, but, no, what are you? I look down at myself and I, I I'm a woman. You know? And then I stand there and I'm oh, you mean the way I'm dressed? Oh, I'm a Muslim. And in this one instance, the lady looked at me and she says, but you're not black. <laughs> I looked at myself and I said, oh my God, you're right. Okay, a little bit of humor. But I was identified as being at least something different. Now I identify myself as being Muslim. Now I have a chance to talk about Islam. 
And when I looked around that store, by the way, I was the only white person there. I was the only white person there. And everybody in the store is laughing. I mean, everybody was laughing. And all these people came up to the front, and we got involved in a conversation that went on for another two and a half hours. After which I gave them my cards and the numbers of friends that I had in that particular area because I was just a passerby. I didn't live there. I was a passerby. I didn't even live in that state. I was just driving through. I met that woman a few years later, and she's a Muslim. That clerk became a Muslim. Okay? What was really fun was she told me, she describes this one guy who had been buying milk that was in the store that day. They're getting married. He's a Muslim too. And all from being identified as a Muslim woman. I feel sorry for the brothers on two counts. Who's to know what they are? I mean, you look at most of them and they could pass for, they could be Italian, they could be Spanish, they could be anything. Who's to know? Because most of them aren't identifiable. I feel sorry because they don't get an opportunity to demonstrate the courage that a Muslim woman has because it takes profound courage to walk out in hijab when you're living in an environment where women in hijab are persecuted. That takes true courage. And the woman is the weaker. I'd like to see my dear brothers go to work in a thobe. Or the Ogala and Gutra. I'd like to see that. How many of them would be working if they had to wear that? Not too many, I think. But women have more courage than they give us credit for. We go to the store, we go to the hospital, we go to the schools. Everything we do in our hijab, inshallah, proudly. Insha'Allah. I want the world to know that I am a Muslim woman. I want the world to know that I am a Muslim woman. I had a feminist ask me a few weeks ago if I was a different woman if I took my hijab off. I told her no. I'm not different. It doesn't change me. She says, why do you have to wear it then? Only one reason. I want to be identified by everyone I meet as a Muslim woman. I want there to be no confusion, no doubt in anyone's mind. That's a Muslim woman. This is my right. And I will fight for this right. And I will maintain this right. Allah gave it to me and no one is taking it away from me. Another right that is frequently confused, okay? Somewhere along the line, people got confused on the issue of polygamy. And someone got the idea that this was for men. And polygamy is not for men, it's for women. Yeah, see, think about it. Think, think. When you get married to a woman, you almost always get a mother-in-law. One wife, one mother-in-law. Two, three, four. Father-in-laws, brother-in-laws. Not only that, but on the day of judgment, you have to answer to Allah for any unhappiness you've caused your wife. One, two, three. Ooh. What is the man getting out of polygamy now? Could someone refresh my memory? 
Now we've got financial responsibility. The man is 100% responsible for all of his wife's needs. One, two, oh my. Again, what was it that the man was getting out of having more than one wife? Mm. You see, that's the confusion. They got this Christian concept, you know, that God only did things for men. Mm -mm. God didn't do everything for men. Polygamy is only of benefit to women. It's the woman who benefits. We have a sister that we can trust completely, that we never have to worry about anything with. We have a sister that's there to help us in all times and in all ways. More and more women are choosing their own co-wives and the marriages are working better because the wisdom of the woman in choosing her co-wife is that she recognizes that this is someone she has to share her life with and she chooses someone who's compatible to everyone. While the man in his little vision there frequently chooses for the wrong reasons and chooses two people who are incompatible. Now don't get from this that I'm saying that men are not allowed to have more than one wife. Polygamy serves a very valuable social function. Polygamy is something that is good. Polygamy is something that is necessary. Polygamy is something that no one can forbid. You do not have the right to forbid the practice of the polygamy. Not under any circumstances. You have a right to educate each other on what the true practice is supposed to be. But you cannot forbid a person. Let's look at some of the social benefits of polygamy, okay? Now, if you were to look at, I don't know, here in Canada, do you do censuses? Do they, does this government does a census? Okay, you might check the Canadian census. I'm familiar with the census in the U.S. And every year I'm checking at the updates from the Census Bureau just to see if things are changing. And things are moving right along the way each year. Increasingly, there's more women than there are men. And the ratio continues to increase more women than men. Islam, unlike other religions, recognizes that women have rights and needs other than just for food and shelter. And those rights and needs can only be met in marriage. Only through marriage. Now if you have more women than men and you take and you marry every man to a woman and you've got 20 million women out here without a husband but they still have the same rights and needs, what is supposed to happen with these 20 million women? And some people say they can live a life of deprivation, do without. It has been proven that women who live in deprivation in this way have more psychological problems and more physical problems. We were designed to be pairs. We were designed to complete each other. We were designed to be interdependent. So this is not acceptable. There was a nun once who told me, well, women should turn to each other for that. Well, I'm sorry, but we're Muslims. We don't accept lesbianism. It's not acceptable to turn to another woman for gratification. So we won't even discuss that. The option that is practiced most is that one woman will steal the husband of another woman. But we have the same, we still have 20 million women without husbands, only now we have children affected and the community is affected. And it becomes like a disease that tears everyone apart. The last is that we can want for our sister that which we want for ourselves. And that's what a woman wants. A woman wishes for her sister that which she wishes for herself. Polygamy is a scary thing, not only for men, but for women as well. It makes women nervous, it makes men nervous, extraordinarily. 
but it's something that you all need to take a look at because there is nothing that was permitted by Allah that is not good for us in some way. Now, most men cannot handle a polygamous relationship and will gladly admit it. I got engaged in December after, what's it been, 15, 16 years. I got engaged in December. And um, things were going along great until I introduced him to my co-wife. And you know, at first he's going, okay, sure, uh-huh. You know, and, and, and he sits and he talks to her and he's talking to me and, and he says, you are really serious. And I said, yes, you know, she's going to be my co-wife. And he says, do I have any say in this? And I looked at her and she looked at me and we said in unison, no. I want a co-wife. This is who I want. If you want to marry me, I want a co-wife. Well, he chickened out. I mean, he just plain chickened out. We stayed engaged for a couple of months and talked about it and talked about it. And he finally says, Avina, he says, I'm scared to death of this. I really, I'm scared to death of this. He says, I'm just afraid that I might not be just between you. And I can't take that chance. We both went, oh well. He lives in Mecca, it would have been so nice, you know, visit the Kaaba on a daily basis, oh well. But see, men, men are as afraid of polygamy as women are, if they're wise. <laughs> if they're wise. But you should remember that polygamy does not benefit the man. It only benefits the woman. Now there's many things that we can talk about in regards to how Islam has been the ultimate liberator of women of men, of children, of parents, of family, of society, of community. And we can be here as long as you want to tonight. And I'll try and answer all the questions that you put to me as best I can. But I cannot leave my little podium here without saying my two cents on something that is extremely important to me. Okay? I really want everyone to listen very carefully to what I have to say at this moment. Okay? Sisters? Sisters? Please, just one minute. If you didn't want to listen about the women, I let you off on that. I won't let you off on this. Okay? I want everyone just to listen to me for two seconds or more. Okay? You are Muslim. Muslim means that you live in submission to Allah. You cannot live in absolute submission to that which you are not familiar with. You as Muslims must return to reading the Quran and reading the Hadith, studying the Sunnah and applying it to your lives. On the day of judgment you will answer to Allah for what you have done and what you have not done and that includes seeking knowledge and applying the knowledge to your life and your existence with each other. At this time we the best of Omas suffer the greatest level of persecution. At this time, we, the best of Omas, live on the lowest incomes worldwide. At this time, we, the best of Omas, have power not over ourselves or anyone else. There is only one reason. The blame does not lie with anyone else except with each one of you. We cannot blame the Jews, we cannot blame the broadcasters, 
We cannot blame the Christians, we cannot blame the governments, we cannot blame political systems. We could not be conquered from without until we destroyed ourselves from within. And we cannot return to power again until we build that which must be built from within first. We must know Quran and Sona. We must apply Quran and Sona in every aspect of our existence. No more excuses. No more excuses. No more laying the blame on anyone else. It's us. We must become Muslims. People say we need cultural bases as a point of reference in communicating with each other. This is what they use to justify to me. This is why <coughs> we identify ourselves as Egyptian, as Pakistani, as Indian, as Jordanian, as Palestinian, as whatever. We have one point of reference and only one point of reference. Yo boys, hello. Hi, I'm here, microphone's mine, you want to talk, we'll talk later. Get his attention and let him know I'm talking straight to him. Hello. The young man in the black coat, hi. Yeah, you, don't look behind you, you, okay? This applies to you. We must identify ourselves by the only point of reference that exists, Allah, Islam. We must not allow ourselves to be separated anymore by artificial boundaries and artificial identities. Allah did not make you Egyptian, Allah did not make you Jordanian, Allah did not make you Palestinian, Allah did not make you Pakistani, Allah made you Muslim. There is only one point of reference necessary for a Muslim to communicate to another Muslim, that is Allah. And Quran and Sunnah. We cannot allow ourselves to continue to be ripped apart and to be destroyed from within by accepting artificial boundaries and by allowing anything but Allah as our point of reference. And so before I go to question and answer tonight, I am begging you to take time every day to read Quran. Ten ayahs a day, that's all, ten little ayahs a day. I'm not saying sit down and read the whole book. Ten ayahs a day. It takes no time. Ten ayahs a day. Re-establish your connection to Allah. Re-establish your identity as a Muslim. Read Quran and read Hadith. If you want to read all of the other books, Alhamdulillah, fine. But don't forget Quran every day. This book testifies for or against you on the day of judgment. Don't put your Quran in a pretty box on a shelf. Uh-uh. This book testifies for or against you as to not only did you read it, but did you apply it. Do not allow your children and your grandchildren to grow up in oppression. Do not allow your children and your grandchildren to suffer as we have. Return to the only point of reference needed by a Muslim, Allah. I thank you very much for inviting me here. And I won't apologize for my tirade, because that's probably the most important thing I had to say tonight. I want you to remember, as Muslims, all praise belongs to Allah. And if anything good has been said tonight, this good came from Allah. If there were mistakes, those were mistakes were made because I am a human being. And I ask you to forgive me for those. Again, Jazakallah khairan for giving me this time.
Yeah, Sylmi, thank you again for your extremely inspiring talk. And I hope that we can take the challenge to just read those ten ayahs a day. And uh, we thank you for reminding us once again of the beauty of the Quran, the beauty of Allah's plan for humankind, and the beauty of the man and the woman relationship in Islam. And I pray that Allah guides us and helps increase our faith and our challenge to make us the best ummah worthy of the name Muslim. Um, okay, now we're going to break for some dinner and then there will be question and answer session. We'll have dinner, pray Isha, and then we'll come back for question and answer, inshallah. So I think Brother Fahad's coming. And uh, inshallah, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help me remember one of the key things that she has said. That is that we could...